Open your Bibles. <laughs> Open your Bibles. Turn into Matthew chapter 5. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's maybe one in the back of the seat in front of you. If uh, there's not, then uh, take the person's next to you. Um, turn it to Matthew chapter 5. What? You have more, you have more Bibles? Kim's not here. Oh, Kim, Kim's here. She can read lips. I can't, Gregory. <laughs> All, right. All right, are you with me? Okay, Matthew chapter five. Title of the message this morning, Be Reconciled. Be Reconciled. It is our 13th and last message. Some of you may say, praise the Lord. It's our last message in the Bait of Satan series. Be Reconciled. Matthew 5, verse 21 to verse 26 is our text. Listen to me, please, right up front here. You'll get a feel for the message. Reconciliation is more important than being right. Reconciliation is more important than being right. Amen. So think of an offense right now, a personal one, not a hypothetical one, but a real one in your life. Just, just get an offense in your mind. Maybe it's current. Maybe it's past. Hopefully it's not future. Uh, but get an offense in your mind. Just giving you a minute. An offense, you know. You got it? All right, here's the question. In that offense that's in your mind, were you the one who was offended or were you the one who did the offending? Seldom when we bring up an offense in our mind do we bring up one where we did the offending. It's usually the other way around. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the offense is you being offended or you doing the offending. God's word is the same. His exhortation is the same. His command is the same. It is be reconciled. Be reconciled. Whether you are on the I was offended side or whether you, if you're honest enough, to say I did the offending, either way, it doesn't matter. God's command is the same. Be reconciled. The only way that you can be free from the bait of Satan in this area of, of harboring offense is to be reconciled. Message today is about being reconciled. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you show us, Lord, how critical this is, Lord, how important this is in our lives, God. Would you show us, Lord, that you have a purpose, God, that you have an exact situation that you want to speak to us about today? We pray, Lord, that even that one that you, Holy Spirit, have already brought up in our minds, that we would keep it in our minds, either past or present, either having been offended or having offended someone else. And we pray, Lord, that you would apply your word as what it is, living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We give you the right to do that in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Are you in Matthew chapter 5? Matthew chapter 5, uh, Jesus is teaching the Sermon on the Mount, and in this particular section in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is taking a command from the law of Moses that is in regards to your actions. This is really important because some of you say, hey, I don't understand the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm going to explain it to you right now as a little side explanation. Jesus has taken the commands of the law of Moses, which are physical or actions, uh, commands about your actions, and he is showing how they are fulfilled in your heart. He's showing that the law of Moses is being fulfilled in the transformation of your heart in the new covenant. As the Holy Spirit fills you, then that law of Mo Moses is fulfilled in us walking in the Spirit. So these verses that we are looking at today are specifically about harboring offense. And they're about harboring offense in our heart. 
And Jesus, here's what Jesus wants you to know, and this is the big, this is a big thing Jesus is teaching here. Harboring offense has serious consequences. That's it. That's it. Harboring an offense in your heart has serious consequences. That's what we're going to see. We'll start in Matthew 5, verse 21, Jesus speaking. He says, you have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. The focus on the actions in the law of Moses. And then look at verse 22a, but, contrast word, but I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment, just like you were in verse 21. The focus in 22a is on your heart in fulfilling the law. Jesus is saying that, that in, in, when you have the Holy Spirit in the new covenant, that it's not just not acting, that God is interested in your heart. And he wants your heart and the condition of your heart. And so Jesus says, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you are harboring offense, if you're harboring offense in your heart, you are subject to judgment. Then notice as we continue in verse 22, notice the increasing judgment with the increasing anger. People struggle with this verse a lot. Like, what does this mean? Because there's some Aramaic words and stuff in there. Uh, I'm, the, the NLT just lays it out for us common folk to be able to understand it. Uh, watch this increasing judgment that goes with increasing levels of anger. Verse 22b of Matthew 5, second, you know, the second level, if you call someone an idiot, see, don't you like the NLT? <laughs> if you call someone an idiot, that's an Aramaic word there. You are in danger of being brought before the Lord. I mean, before the court. The word idiot's not Aramaic. Racha is. And so this is uh, NLT's version. But here's the deal. This word, this word means to insult somebody. So from 22A to 22B, we go from being angry to insult. That's the point. And as we go from being angry to insulting someone, our judgment increases from being subject to judgment in 22A to being brought before the court in 22B. Do you see it? Increasing anger, increasing judgment. Finally, Matthew 5, 22C, and if you curse somebody, if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. It's just what it says. So, angry, subject to judgment, insulting, brought before the court, cursing, danger of the fires of hell. Here's the point. When we are harboring offense, if we are moving from anger to insulting to cursing, then we are moving from judgment to greater judgment to greater judgment. And so, and so when, when you see a teaching like this, don't, don't split hairs. Don't be like, well, just you look at this and you say, you know what? I think it's not good. Right? I think the whole anger to insulting to cursing, I think it's, I think what Jesus is saying is don't do it. Right, that's, that's kind of where we actually live. It's very similar, a couple weeks ago, we did Matthew 18 in the Unforgiving Servant. Do you remember? It's the text I teach all the time, every chance I get about divine forgiveness. And the Unforgiving Servant in Matthew 18 was put in prison to be tortured until his full debt was paid, and it was an unpayable debt. And so we see that, that, that um image of being tortured in Matthew 18, here the image is greater and greater judgment, both from the same thing, harboring offense, from not forgiving, from not being reconciled. And so point number one, not that, not that I do points, but if I did, point number one would be um, the, the greater anger you harbor, the greater judgment you're bringing into your life. It's just motivation, isn't it? That's motivation to say, you know what? What's the answer? What, if, I, if I know this is wrong, what's the answer? The answer is divine forgiveness and reconciliation. 
divine forgiveness and reconciliation with those who have wronged you or just as much those who feel that you have wronged them. So first two verses, 21 and 22, are for the person who was on the I was offended side, right? I'm angry, I'm offended, I'm holding this against this person. Now look how fast Jesus switches to the I did the offending. So it's both, and they're all right here. There's actually three, but this is the second one, Matthew 5, verse 23. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, meaning that they feel that you have offended them, right? It's switching now from the I've been offended to I have done the offending. If you remember that you have offended someone, that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled, go and be reconciled, go. They feel that you have offended them, leave your gift at the altar, your sacrifice at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. So completely different situation, right? You're, you're just going along your business, you know? And, and suddenly the Holy Spirit brings up, you know, this person, this person's angry at you. This person feels that you've offended them. And uh, this person may be in any of those three steps of, of increasing anger. What if, what if you say, and this is our first response always, but Lord, I didn't do anything wrong. Right, isn't it? Come on. Come on. <laughs> Pride kills and we all have the disease. All right, it is 100% common disease. And so we always say, well, I didn't do anything wrong, or I just did this, or I was right, right? Uh, so none of that's in here. It's not in here. Jesus' response is the same. Leave your sacrifice there at the altar. It implies an urgency, all right? If, if you're there worshiping or bringing an offering to the Lord, and Jesus says, hey, um, pass. Well, why don't you just go ahead and, and leave here? This is an it's, um, it's the emphasis is on the urgency of it. This, and this may correct some guilt in you or whatever. Jesus is not saying that you are unworthy to worship if someone is mad at you, all right? I, you know, <clears throat> in 20 years here, um, well, let's just say I wouldn't be able to worship very often, Okay. <laughs> which makes a message like this really hard for me to realize how many people you know, are angry at me. Um, but another story. Um, and really, I have to deal with that, right? I do. And I have to say, okay, God, how did I handle this situation? And, and if I handled it right and they got angry, then all I can do is say, I'm sorry. And you know, I'm sorry you got angry, but... If I handled it wrong, then I'm right in this boat where I, I need to go and ask their forgiveness. And so there's a lot of those things in my life and a, a lot of that because, because um, you know, pe people in, in general don't want to hear the truth. Um, and there's some people who are called to speak the truth. And so it's a really hard thing because I have to be so gentle. Anyway, it's not about me. It's about you, Okay. <laughs> Not about me, but I will tell you, it's a really personal message. Um, here's the point. Jesus is not saying you're not worthy to worship. He's, say, he's not saying you're, you're, you're not eligible to worship. He's not saying you're forbidden to worship. He's saying, listen, listen, he's saying that it's more important that you are reconciled with that person than that you worship. That's heavy, right? Maybe think of it this way. What if being reconciled to that person is truly more of an act of worship than going through the act of worship? What if being reconciled with that person is more of a sacrificial worship of the Lord than going through the motions of, of what we call church? That's exactly what he's saying. It's better to go take care of that. 
It's not that you're forbidden to worship. It's that it's more important that you be reconciled. Really big, really big. So here's the question. Is this urgency for us to be reconciled with the person that we've offended, is this urgency for our good or is it for that person's good? I know it sounds like the right answer, right? It's not. It's for that person's good. What if, what if this? What if you actually, you know, small chance, what if you actually didn't do anything wrong? Like what if, what if you know, what if you did your best to, to go in love, to speak in love, to, you know, like you really don't understand why they're so offended by you? That person is in a growing a trend of anger. So they're going from anger towards you to insulting you to cursing you, which means they're bringing more and more judgment on themselves. What, what does that have to do with you? What if you can stop them from destroying their life with that anger towards you? What if, what if you can, by reconciling with them, you can stop the destruction that that sin of anger and offense is bringing into their heart? Then it's about them, right? Isn't it? It is. It's for their good. Once we understand the damage of unforgiveness and anger and bitterness and resentment and all the stuff that the devil uses to destroy our lives, once we understand that's going on in another person's life, then if we say, Lord, I... I pray for them. I feel bad for them. What can I do to help them out of these destructive sins? And the Lord would say, well, go and be reconciled to them. Even if you didn't do anything wrong, or if you think you didn't do anything wrong, which is more likely. Ooh, man, that's some serious stuff, isn't it? <laughs> huh? <laughs> if there was a joke, I'd throw it in there right now, but Here's the hard truth, okay? This is really, really, really a hard truth. When it comes to being reconciled, whether you were right or wrong has absolutely no bearing. It doesn't have anything to do with whether you were right or wrong. And honestly, it doesn't have anything to do with whether you intentionally offended someone or not. Either way, Jesus Christ calls you to be reconciled, no matter which side of the offense you're on. If you've been offended, Jesus calls you to be reconciled so that sin of anger doesn't destroy your life. If you have offended, even unintentionally, Jesus calls you to go and be reconciled to save that other person. It really is to save that other person. Doesn't that make it a little easier? But if you go in the wrong spirit, they're just gonna get even more mad at you, which I can uh, verify by example, by experience. Uh, so you gotta be really ready to go. But the point is, is he's, Jesus is saying, be reconciled as quickly as possible. Make it a priority. It's more important that, that you are recon, being reconciled than that you are worshiping. It's, it's a hardcore truth. All right, can I just say one other thing about all this? When we find ourselves on that, you know, I did the offending side, like I've said already, we often think, I didn't do anything. And I, you know, it's not my fault. I was right. I was only doing what I was supposed to do, you know. Here's what John Bevere says. I didn't put this on the screen, but I should have. John Bevere is, is the author of this book, The Bait of Satan. And he, he wrote this sentence, and it's awesome. Listen really carefully. Often, and I would say most often, we judge ourselves by our intentions and we judge everyone else by their actions. So we say, we tend to say, well, my intentions were good. I was just trying to do what was right. I was just trying to do, you know, what's best. And, and we have an incorrect view of our actions because we believe our intentions were good. Does that make sense? We view our actions through our intentions. Well, I didn't mean to hurt him. Well, <laughs> they don't know that. I have been on the receiving end uh, of a person who prides themselves in brutal honesty about their opinion. It's, it's like no one I've ever met in my life. Um, and, and this person 
this person will hit you with their opinion like a freight train. And um, it's always damaging. It always hurts for me. And I think, I think for others too. But no matter how much damage this does, this is the thing that you got to understand. That I have to understand. This person uh, that, that I've had to learn to, to you know, to, to deal with, um, they actually think they're doing what's best. They actually believe their intentions are good and that you need to know how big of a stupid, no good idiot you are. It's the best thing for you. It's just know the truth, you know, <laughs> just know who you are. And, and somehow that's supposed to be good. Uh, but for someone like me, whose love language is encouraging words, that doesn't work. Uh, like I may know I'm an idiot, but you know, I don't need it confirmed that loud. So here's what it's done to me, reviewing this, this, this relationship, is it's made me understand that sometimes that I've heard other people believing that my intentions were good, right? So I can look at that pain that's, that's, that I've experienced in that relationship and um, say, man, have I done that? Have I said, you know, something that was true, but maybe I didn't handle it right. Or maybe even something that wasn't true, I, I don't know. But we have to understand that even if we believe our intentions are good, it doesn't matter. If, if that person has been offended, and if there's a way for us to reconcile with them, which sometimes there's not, uh, if there's a way to reconcile with them, then we should, we should reconcile with them. <laughs> it reminds me. Uh, this, is, this is so about me that, that I can't, I just can't stop. But I just, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, what, what, what situations, you know, are you in where you're not required to reconcile? So, so I had someone here in this, in this courtyard a couple years ago, um, you know, someone that, that I would like to reconcile with that, that, you know, is angry, and, and the guys came in and circled around me, and they said, hey, this person's out in the courtyard. He's demanding to talk to you, and he has a knife. I said, yeah, it's probably not time to be reconciled with that person yet. Uh, and so he was, he was uh, escorted off. But uh, there's sometimes where you just say, look, I want, it, I want to reconcile, but it might not be safe. Or, or I might not be ready. What if your heart's not ready? How, what does it look like when your heart's not ready? When you go and justify your actions, psh, you're done. You're, done. You're, you're gonna go and try to, try to reconcile with someone and you start by defending yourself or by, hey, I was just trying to do this. <sighs> Have you ever seen jet fuel on a fire? Okay, it's awesome in the desert, like racing fuel, throw a bunch on the fire and boom. <clears throat> It's not good when it comes to relationships, okay? Jet fuel on the fire. When you go and say, look, I was just this, I was just that. You know, my intentions were good. I was just trying, I was, you know, what I said, anytime you're defending yourself, forget about it. You're just gonna blow the whole thing up. Jesus is not calling us to justify our actions or our intentions. He's calling us to be reconciled, and it's different. You have to go with a different heart. You go with a different purpose, with a different goal in mind. You go to that person with the sole goal of being reconciled, not defending or justifying your position or your actions. That's prideful, destructive sin. So, whether we're being offended or whether we are offending either by, either on purpose or not, the first step is to be reconciled. Psalm 34, 14 is on the wall. 34, 14 of Psalms says, turn away from evil. Turn from evil and do good. Here's a part that I, that's important. Search for peace and work. Is it hard to reconcile with someone? Oh my gosh. I mean, I don't know if I'd rather, I don't know. I, I think maybe my pinky, I'd rather have my pinky smashed. You know, I mean, there's some, there's some amount of pain I'd rather go through. Being reckon, is it just me? Are you guys all like, yeah, I love it. No, you don't love it, you hate it. it this is hard, it's hard to be reconciled, why? 
because our pride is this huge monster that's controlling our lives that must be crucified. Search for peace, work to maintain it. Psalm 34, 14 says, Romans 14, 19 says, so then let us pursue what makes for peace. Not justifying our actions, not, not you know, defending ourselves, not being all that, but pursue what makes for peace and for building up one another. That term for building up one another is the same idea of submitting to in the general sense, coming underneath and building one another up. We are called to pursue what makes for peace, not pursue what justifies our actions or what we think is right or what we think should be done, but pursue what makes for peace and pursue what leads to building up one another. If I go to that person who feels that I've offended them and I say to them, hey, 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 what's your problem? That's not really a building up kind of way to start, right? You have to go and, and pursue peace, and it usually means um, humble apologies, humble forgiveness. We've got to go searching for peace. We've got to work to maintain peace. We've got to pursue peace, pursue building up that person, which means that we have to crucify our pride and go in true humility. This is really, really hard to do. Uh, because, because we say we understand it, but then we react in pride. So your humility is, is this. Your humility is not defending yourself. It's not justifying your actions. It's not explaining yourselves, yourself. All of that is, is self-interest. When you're really going to reconcile, you go only concerned for that other person and for making their relationship right which means there's some stuff that you feel that you don't get to say. Because what you feel isn't godly. So don't say it. You have to go with true humility. One single goal, be reconciled. And sometimes you have to work through that to be able to go. And if you go too quick, you're gonna be the jet fuel on the fire person, all right, which I have been. Jesus continues to make the priority clear in uh, verse, uh, verses 25, 26 in Matthew 5. I told you there were three. This is the third one. Look at this one. This is awesome. Matthew 5, 25 says, when you are on the way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. Now, do you notice here it doesn't, it's not implying whether you did the offending or whether you were offended? So this is for everybody. If you got an adversary, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to an officer and you will be thrown into prison. And if that happens, you surely won't be free again until you have paid the last penny. So here's what we've just seen Jesus say. In verses 21 and 22, he says, if you're angry over some offense, go and be reconciled, especially if your anger is growing, the insulting and cursing, be reconciled because your judgment is growing. Verses 23 and 24 say, if someone has been offended by you, if you have caused the offense, go and be reconciled. It's more important than worship, which is mind-boggling. Verses 25 and 26 say, if you have an adversary for any reason, whether they're, you know, whether they did something to you, you did something to them, you did something to each other, whatever it is, if you have an adversary for any reason, be reconciled. The command from Jesus is exactly the same in all three settings, whether you've been offended, whether you've offended, or whether you're just whatever, things aren't working out, you're you know, you're just rubbing up against each other. In all three situations, the command is the same. You say it for me. Be reconciled. I hate this part, Lord. Be reconciled. You know, if I was talking about the prosperity gospel and told you, you know, say this and you'll get a bunch of money, they'd be like, woo, praise the Lord. No, listen, okay, let me just do it. Let me just try again now that I've guilted you into it. 
Whether you've been offended or whether you've offended or whether you're just, you know, at war with somebody, what's the command from Jesus? Be reconciled. Just be reconciled. Just, you know, listen, it's no easier for me and I have to teach it. It's hard, man. It's really hard. All right, let's look at one other text real quick and then we'll wrap up. There's enough of this stuff. Matthew 18, just flip over to chapter 18 of Matthew. We've been there once. Uh, this is uh, the previous section. This section, I, 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 I love and hate this section. I, I hate this section because it's so misused in the church today. It's, it's, it's shocking. Starts in verse 15, Matthew 18, verse 15. Unfortunately, this section has been often described as church discipline. Have you ever, have you ever heard this section be described as church discipline? discipline, implying that the primary goal of Jesus' teaching here is the church disciplining a believer. It's not. It's not. That probably came from, you know, somewhere in the Middle Ages or something, you know, when they tied people to the stake or something. I don't know. But the goal is not, the primary goal is not church discipline. Is there church discipline? Yeah. Is that the goal? No. The goal here is is reconciliation. It is. It's reconciliation. That's the goal. And if we as churches get all like, oh, rah, 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 you know. Uh, <laughs> does that make any sense to you? That, oh, rah, 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 you know. <laughs> That's the whole, we're in charge here, you know. <laughs> like, shut up. Jesus is in charge. The primary goal here is not disciplining a believer. The primary goal here is reconciliation. The Net Bible, which I strongly recommend, highly recommend the Net Bible, the New English Translation with its study notes. The Net Bible, the section heading over this section says restoring Christian relationships. That's what this is about. It's about restoring Christian relationships. That's the primary goal. Let's read it. Matthew 18, verse 15. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, here's the point of the verse. You have won that person back. This isn't like go attack this person if they've offended you. Because, you know, if you've ever tried it, you don't often win that person back. You don't often become reconciled with that person. This is not about attacking somebody. We've had that done, and it's rough. Not, not just to me. I mean, some of y'all been had this. Uh, if someone offends you, go to them. Be reconciled. If you have, if, if it works, you've won that person back. You have to go in humility and in gentleness and pursuing peace and unity and say, listen, I just need you to know that that thing you said at the donut table when, you know, you knocked the donut out of my hand and you said, go ahead and eat it, it's on the ground, it won't hurt you. That, I'm just trying to think up an example. Uh, that hurt me. That hurt me. You offended me when you knocked the donut out of my hand. And, and if that person says, I did, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I, I don't even remember knocking a donut out of your hand. I, I apologize for that. Please forgive me. Then you say, okay, let's hug and hug it out. You know, uh, you know let's get over it. That's the point of this verse is go make things right one-on-one. -on -one. Go to that person and say, look, I'm sorry, man, but I've been struggling with what you did here. And that person would be like, really? I did that? I mean, if you're talking to me, I'd be like, are you sure it was me? I, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, but that person would say, including me, please forgive me. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. And then you've won them back. You've restored that relationship. But verse 16 says, second step, not in church discipline, second step in restoring a fellow believer but if you're unsuccessful at reconciliation one-to-one, -one, 
take one or two others with you and go back again. And this is where we get like this brute squad image. Are you on the brute squad? I am the brute squad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, what's that movie called? Princess Bride, right? Oh, man, it's so funny. All right. You are the brute squad. Um, Matthew 18, verse 16. This is not the brute squad. If you are unsuccessful at reconciliation, take one or two others with you and go back so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. These are not the brute squad. This isn't, you know, getting the elders, which people, you know, try to get us to do all the time. And we do it. I mean, we do it. We, we have these meetings. And, and, you know, mostly they go really poorly. Um, <laughs> This is not about that. It's not about taking the elders and getting, getting all disciplinary, and on, disciplinary on somebody. This is about taking people with you for accountability to help restore the goal. The context hasn't changed from the end of verse 15. We've won that person back. The context is still the same. Win the person back. So if you can't do it yourself, then take someone with you who can mediate, who can counsel, and who can help you be accountable where, where they say, whoa, 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 you kind of got off on yourself there. Back it down a little bit, right? They're meant to be helpful, not to attack the person or to apply any kind of pressure, but to help work things out, help restore that person. We have done this. I promise you we've done this. We've done it is to the best of our ability. We've done it well, and, and, and we've seen this third step too. Step three, Matthew 18, 17 says, if the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. Simply meaning don't associate with them. Just, you have to, sometimes you have to stop associating with people. I mean, if, you know, if they want to talk to you with a knife in their hand, you, you know, there's some people you just say, nah. I think it's best if we don't. Um, <laughs> I bring that stuff on myself. Um, the goal here is still reconciliation. Can you imagine it? All you have to do, I don't have time to get into it, but 1 Corinthians 5 and 2 Corinthians 2 1 Corinthians 5 and 2 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 5, Paul instructs the church at Corinth to, to remove a person from the fellowship, to stop fellowshipping with them, which is what this verse, Matthew 18, 17, says. Uh, because he's sleeping with his mother-in-law. And Paul's like, um, you know, let's, let's let him know that that's not right. So let's encourage him to, um, you know, either pick his sin or, or fellowship. But then in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, He's, he's repented, receive him back. And he encourages the church to forgive him and to receive him back. And so you have this perfect picture in these two chapters of this working. Second Thessalonians 3, same thing happens. Uh, Paul basically uh, encourages the same thing. And so even when we say it would be best if you didn't fellowship here, which we usually say when people are causing division and dis we always say it. When people are causing division, discord, dissension, slander, attack in the church, attack in the leadership, we'll just encourage them, look, I know a church that would love for you to attack them. Let me just, let me just <laughs> encourage you to go there. Um, you know, we try to politely say that, you know, that that's not health, healthy uh, for you to be doing that. Um, but the goal is reconciliation. Even then, when we say, look, we've tried, we've come to you personally, we've come to you two or three, and now we're coming to you as the church body, you know, it's best if you don't continue this in, in the family here. Uh, which same thing you do for a teenager that's out of control in the house, right? If you've got young kids and, you know, your teenager's doing stuff in the house that's unhealthy, you say, look, it's best if you don't. You know, so, you know, it's tough love, right? That's what this is, it's tough love. But, but it's, not, it's not ostracizing its consequences to prayerfully inspire repentance. Is that okay? Does it make sense? 
Matthew 18 is about restoring, not discipline. The point today is this. All through the New Testament, the command where there is offense, the command is to do everything you can as much as depends on you to reconcile, to live in peace with everyone. That's the command over and over and over again. Yeah, there are times when that can't happen, where it shouldn't happen, it's not safe to happen, it's not time yet to happen, and when it's not time, it's generally because of you, because you, you know, your pride isn't, hasn't allowed you to get in that place yet. That's the number one obstacle is your pride. Kill it. Kill your pride, man. Be crushed. And I'll do the same. I'll continue to do the same. <sighs> pride kills. And we all got the disease. If we're going to be reconciled, we have to be made right first. And that usually means crucifying our pride. Don't defend yourself. Don't defend your actions. Don't justify your actions. If you've been offended, if you've been offended, go to that person and try to win that relationship back. If you have offended someone and you you know, and even if you didn't mean to or you don't understand why, go to that person and apologize and ask them to forgive you in a spirit of humility, gentleness, meekness, patience, peace, love, all the fruit of the spirit. <sighs> We have to make a commitment to make allowances for each other's faults, right? I mean, we're a family with a bunch of sinners, and, and, and we're not even blood, all right? We're adopted. We're an adopted family, and so we're going to offend each other. We're going we're gonna to rub up against each other. Um, thank God, like in, in real families, <laughs> although this does happen. I've seen this. I think I might have done this, actually, when I was a kid. You know, where someone says, I'm done with this family. I'm going to go get another one, you know? <laughs> Right? I think I might have done that. <clears throat> My brother definitely did. Um, don't do that. And don't do that in church. Don't be like, oh, man, this church is full of sinners. I'm going to find one that isn't. Yeah, good luck, you know. <laughs> Plus, if you do find one that has no sinners in it, as soon as you walk in, you blow the whole thing. <laughs> so give up, man. Ephesians 4, 1 to 3 to close. says, therefore, I a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults. Make allowance for each other's faults. That person, if enemy, yeah, they're a sinner. Make allowance for it. Make allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. That's such an awesome verse, such an awesome translation. Make every effort, strive, work, to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Peace, that's what the Lord Jesus calls us to. And throughout this whole series, 13 messages, that's the point. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit and binding yourselves together with peace. Do not take the bait of Satan. Deal with offense in your life and be reconciled. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you make that stick by your spirit, Lord? May your word pierce going in and heal coming out. May it be what it is, a discerner of our thoughts and intentions, Lord. God, would you reveal to us where this applies to us, Lord? This is worthless time spent if we don't apply your word. Would you apply it right now? Holy Spirit, would you bring up that person in our lives that you are speaking about to us today. Just give us their face, Lord. And Lord, would you give us the strength to go, to go and be reconciled. Lord, whether we think we're right or wrong, 
Help us to crush our pride and to go. May our number one priority be reconciliation. May we not defend ourselves or justify our action, but may we go pursuing peace, Lord. And where possible, God, may we be restored. May we be reconciled to each member in the body, whether attending here or not. Lord, this is how we actually follow you. This is what it looks like to actually be little Christ, to be Christians. Would you just, before we close, would you just make a commitment, some commitment, either a commitment to go or a commitment to continue to crush your pride until you can go and be reconciled. We just give you a second to pray. Lord Jesus, make it real. Transform our lives, we pray. And may you be glorified in it. May your name be lifted high. And may you be glorified. We pray it all according to your name, Jesus. Amen.